Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Um, today I'd like to welcome our very amazing group of panelists, uh, Dr. Figi Levi Lagazi, Comrade Manku Noruka, and Comrade Jackie. Thank you so much for making the time. And to our guests who have uh, taken the afternoon off to be part of this um, discussion. I am truly, truly grateful that you have taken the time to be with us today. Um, and welcome to um, another uh, Azapo online education conversation. I am sure that this is going to be amazing and I'm sure that we are going to learn a lot from each other. Um, just for housekeeping purposes, can I ask that we all mute our mics um, if we are not talking so that we can limit background noises. Um, can I also um, ask that if you have a question, you can put it into the chat um, and our panelists can deal with it. Um, and also, if you have something that you want to say, please put your hand up. Um, so the session is going to run this way. So we're going to give our panelists an opportunity to just give us their thoughts on the topic. And then we are going to quiz that a little bit um, and have just a round table conversation. And then we're going to open the floor um, to the guests that are on the platform to have a chat with us. Um, this, uh, this, this session is also on Facebook Live. So we have people that are joining us from different countries. Um, welcome, um, and yes, um, thank you so much for making the time to, to come through. So without further ado, I'm going to start with the people that are on my screen as the first person, Ukoko uh, Solomon, um, who you are seeing on your screen as Dr. Figi de Vilagazi. Um, Ukoko Koko Vilagazi um, is a teacher and avid um, activist of the indigenous knowledge systems. Um, she's a healer as well as a lecturer at the uh, at UKZN. And um, she's a founder of many, many, many uh, organizations that look at issues of gender-based violence, including um, the abuse of uh, and, and, and rape of women and particularly gays and lesbians. So she's been in the field working very, very hard for women. And I look forward to learning from her in this conversation. Next, I have uh, Comrade Manku Noruka, who I admire a lot. She is one of the first females to take up uh, a senior position in this glorious movement, Dear Azapo. And she is literally bulldozing her way and making women felt wherever she goes. An avid activist and someone who's really, really passionate and an avid African feminist. Welcome to the show. And we have Comrade Jakey, my history with Comrade Jakey is quite long. Um, as a fellow activist, she's a founder of several um, organizations and currently she is with the Lord's Love Rebels, which she founded very recently. Um, she is an avid feminist, a poet and a writer. 
um, an incredible politician and one who's always breaking down spaces in the political space, particularly where women are concerned in terms of making sure that women have a voice. So I'm looking forward to her um, views on a number of subjects. Uh, Comrade Jackie, welcome. And thank you so much for coming through. You can unmute yourselves. Uh, thank you so much, Comrade Jackie. Okay. Um, to, to get us uh, off uh, the track, I'm going to ask Ooh, Dr. Figile just to give us um, her understanding of the topic and what she wants to share with us. Um, Comrade Fix, off to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Comrade KK. And I call it comrade comfortably because we, we have a long way where we come from uh, together in various spaces. And I'm absolutely grateful to, to connect with you also in this platform, Yentlang uh, Um, Azapo. And this particular topic that we are talking about today is absolutely at the center of my heart um, and mind and body, really. Um, because it is part of our, of our lived uh, realities and experiences um, as, um, as, as women in all our diversities in South Africa, but also, you know, we carry it from, from our mother's wombs as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intergenerational thing when we talk about feminism, we talk about landlessness, and we talk about racism, we are actually touching at the center of our woundedness. Um, and I think it's very important to start it in that way, um, that when, when we talk about this, we talk about an experience of oppression, right? And we're talking about how that experience is layered over time. And, and, and I think that is something I would like to talk about today. How is it that it happened that we find ourselves as, um, as people and as bodies who identify as, as women in the country, uh, being at the center of plentlessness and uh, being also on the receiving end of the pain and, and you know, of, of, of racism. Where do we come from with that? I would like to, to, to speak a lot about that um, so that, you know, it, it is always my view that I think it's important for us to know where we come from so that when we make certain statements, when we speak in the manner that we speak, when we activist in the manner that we activist and call for things that we call for, that these things are not seen as falling from sky, but actually they are reality. Some things have not changed. Things have happened in the past. Um, and I think that it's important also that we, when we have this conversation, we really are having it as a conversation of pain, but also a conversation of healing, a conversation of love, because we have loved our mothers. We've loved our great grandmothers. And we are who we are because we are a generation of, and we cannot um, outlive that story because when we do that, we are fragmenting ourselves. So I'd really would like to talk about that and um, you know, just to just memory, take us a little bit way memory lane, but also to say, why is it then that things are the way they are today, where we have a situation like in Guazulu Natal, for example, where women have suffered greatly in the hands of Ingonyama Trust, for example, um, and many other examples that we can use and, and, and how do we heal ourselves from that? So I will stop it here uh, just as a way of introduction and allow my other uh, comments to share and we'll come back. Thank you, Comrade Fix. I really look forward to that, particularly um, I know we've had some serious engagements about women who've ended up having to die, um, yeah. you know, you know, and trying to tackle this issue. So thank you so much um, for, for your willingness to, to, to go there. Uh, uh, Comrade Manku, uh, over to yes, you. Uh, thank you so much, Comrade Keke. Uh, uh, that was a powerful introduction from Comrade Fix. That's, that's really amazing. And I'm really honored to be part of the caliber of women that we have in this platform today. Um, I, I would like, this, this topic is also very close to my heart. Uh, when we talk about issues of women and we most specifically look at the issue of um, 
landlessness. It's, it's an issue that is close to my heart because I believe that the reason why women, we are at where we are right now in this country today is because of the issue of landlessness. And there is no woman that can really say that um, they have been pro uh, properly liberated or liberated at all if they do not have the issue of land. And, and currently what we see, it's, it's really not, not, not on. But in my topic today, uh, in, in, in my contribution, I would, like, uh, I would like to take us back to the history of, of women activism on issues, on, on a broad number of issues, and then zone in into the issue of uh, landlessness. And as well as, and I'm not going to talk only about South Africa, I, want, I would like to touch uh, the whole continent of Africa because I believe that we've got the same problems um, as children of, of this great uh, continent. And we, we, we can also look at that. So this is, this is where I would like to take our, 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 our discussion to and also look at the number of statistics as we currently have in um, the, the audit, the land audit uh, that was done by government. Uh, I was looking at the 2017 report uh, because there isn't a, the most recent one and how women are being affected and the, the terrible numbers of women uh, owning land, uh, how they look like, most specifically African women. Uh, this is where I would like to discuss, thank you. Thank you so much. I really am looking forward to that because, you know, we talk of freedom and yet it doesn't quite translate, particularly for women. Um, we've got great uh, policies, but it really is not translating. So um, I, I am looking forward to your contribution there. Comrade Jackie, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, both uh, Dr. Fix and Comrade Manku for, for those introductions. And I would like to carry on from where Comrade Manku uh, left off um, about this being about the continent. You know, we are going to talk about South African context, but mostly about the continent because I don't think you can talk about black consciousness and not talk about Pan Africanism. It's like talking about a parent and not a child, you know? Um, especially when you look at landlessness and racism, it is a continental and uh, a Pan Africanist problem um, and it needs a Pan Africanist solution. I don't think anybody can do it on their own. So I'm looking forward more to looking at landlessness uh, in terms of um, the original dispossession, I think side by side with spirituality. Therefore, I don't think we can talk about land or landlessness um, and also not talk about spirituality. Um, when you look at racism itself, uh, it speaks to a dispossession. So it's not surprising that the two are are related because what one happened as a result of, of the other. So I would also like to also hear from the panelists and others um, around, around grappling uh, with that as well. I think no matter what freedoms we may have, um, if we still don't have land, it kind of renders all those other freedoms pointless because land really is, is the grounding. You literally have to have something to at least walk on, to build on, to feed from and to do spiritual practices on, and even just to look at it, if you want to look at it, just to have that piece of, of earth that we, we belong in just to, to go back to our humanity. So the dispossession of land, I think is very related to the dispossession of spirituality. And until those two things um, are, are restored, no freedom is, is a true freedom. Thank you so much. I, I, I can't agree with you more. And I think nothing irks me as the idea of racism in Africa. Um, it's, it's like just a, it's a weird conundrum, I, but it's, it's, it's such a reality. Um, and I'm so glad that during the month of uh, Women's Month, we are sitting here talking about these issues and adding our voice um, to, to these topics. Um, Dr. Figil, I'm gonna come back to you and ask you to take us back um, so that we have an understanding of how we find ourselves here. Togozani, eh, Togozani, eh, thank you so much, Keke. I would also like to greet everybody that is joining us on the various platforms, Sibingelele eh, Njabulo, Bandabatala for joining us. I, I just want to, it, this is just a, a reminder, and I think that all of us really know about uh, the stories. Some of us have experienced the stories um, in our own flesh and blood. 
and some of us um, we learn about these things um, as 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 we interact with the with formal and informal education, but also education through activism and politics. But I think it's important to to remind one another why is it that we are sitting with the question of landlessness. Um, and, 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 and I think we need to, to look at, if I look at the story of, um, of South Africa in particular, we are talking about deliberate um, orchestration, deliberate introduction and deliberate separation of people um, on the grounds of the color of our skin, right? That's very, very important uh, to start with that. And that deliberateness also was linked to the issue of land, to the issue of spirituality, like uh, Jackie is saying. So what happened um, actually is that um, in, in 1913, we had, um, and I can take it even way beyond that, we had a situation in South Africa where we were colonized, and, and, and some of us argue that we continue to be colonized uh, by, by the British, uh, for example, you know, um, who over time, we come from the First World War, um, even before then we, we, we come from the, let me just bring it to the context of, of South Africa and bring it to the context of the anglo Boer War, what we know as the South African War. And, and why that war is important is something to remember. Um, this war happened for territory. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about land, amongst other reasons why we had what we call the South African War or the anglo Boer War is because British, um, white men in South Africa and Afrikaner white men in South Africa were fighting for territory for a piece of land, something that already had, um, had been a, a, a place of contestation in other parts of the continent. And I think other speakers will touch on that when we look at the scramble for Africa, when we look at, look at the partitioning of, of Africa at the Berlin conference with various uh, European countries, we know the story, you know, um, apportioned pieces of land for themselves, for gain. And in that process, um, African people, and in the context of South Africa in particular, black people had to be possessed of land. And, and what, meant, what, what it meant is that policies then were put in place, including the 1913 Land Act. And there are many other pieces of legislation that we can touch on that were called natives pieces of legislation, uh, the natives people, um, and most of them were linked to, to, to land to say, if you were, you were considered to be a native, in other words, if you are non-European, um, particularly black in South Africa, you would be allocated a particular piece of land taken from the land where you were born, where you were living, where you were tendering, where you, were, you, were, you, you did not even have to worry about money, we were eating, we, had, we were living together with cattle um, and, and so on, our great parents were doing that. The 1913 Land Act meant that um, our great grandparents had to be removed from those pieces of land. We have examples like, for example, the District 6. We have examples like Sophia Town. For those of us who live in areas of Fouting, we know Sophia Town today as Oakland Park. Some of us know it as Triumph. Those were not original names. This is where our parents and our great parents used to stay and we were removed from that. Similarly, in experiences of Cape Town, where we talk about uh, the district, district six and there are many others that I can mention. It was because of this um, 1913 um, Land Act. What did it do? It ensured that those who are dispossessed of land are not given the permission to own that land, to buy that land, to work in that land anymore. And what the 1913 Land Act did, it, it then created small reserves where black people, which is your mother and my mother, your great grandmother and my grandmother and the great parents, our fathers as well, were relocated to what you call these small pieces of reserves, 90, more than 99%, 95% of land was going to then be owned by the Europeans and uh, black, people would then have to share that small percentage of land, which is called reserves. Work in it, be happy in it, make food in it, and so on, which was an impossible task to do. And that, um, that was a deepening of the experiences of landlessness. And how then feminism matters in the story is that, as we all know, our mothers were left at home 
during experiences of oppression where mostly our fathers generally had to go to war. Remember, we are talking here a context where the, the world globally is going through the first world war, which ended in 1917. So when the 1913 Land Act happened, it actually occurred in that context of war. And because we were a colony, um, it meant that some of our fathers who, 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 who were soldiers for the colony, for the British Empire had to fight um, in the war. They were also um, deployed to go and fight on behalf of the colony. And that is what happened in many parts of the African continent as well. When you were a colony, the colonizer could take um, our fathers and some of our mothers as soldiers to go and fight in the war. So that is the context of the 1939 Act. And I think it's important to remember this because memory can never be contested. This is not something that we are creating. It's not like we are saying black people are fighting for special rights. Something was taken through this. And then there were many other pieces of legislation, a, a comrades that came into being a, over time as, as, as we, were, we were grappling you know, with this issue of, 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 of landlessness. Displacements occurred, um, things like migration patterns started to emerge because if Ubaba was not at home, it meant that hunger and starvation became the order of the day. Mothers became heads of households. Children, particularly girl children, became heads of households. Our fathers were in prison. Our fathers um, were fighting in the war and some of them had to, of course, die uh, fighting on the war and others were forcefully uh, had, to, had to go to, to exile. So mothers became the cornerstones of our families and our homes, as fragmented as we were, and had to then migrate into various parts of the cities. And there were a number of other legislations immediately after the 1913 Land Act that came into being. And those pieces of legislation, uh, Comrade Keke, please feel free to stop me because I can speak forever when my time is... is, is uh, is, 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 is sort of covered. So okay. we, what, what happened then is that we, our mothers and our grandmothers migrated to cities, which is what you see today as a special pattern where we are talking about informal settlements. Some people call it squatters. Some people call it a, in, you know, informal settlements where you see places like Alexandra, places like Katomena, Chinabanyabetu, I grew up in Soweto, for example, you know. Uh, which is one of the communities, which is one of the communities that was formed as a result of the spatial segregation, as a result of this landlessness, you know. Um, but our mothers were, were resilient. Our mothers said, we are not going to sit here in these reserves that you're demarcating for us, but we will come and flood the places that you've taken us away from. They going back to the cities, particularly most of those were, were urban, were urban uh, areas, which is also something that was brought and deepened by the Urban Areas Act. The Urban Areas Act literally strengthened and deepened what the 1913 Land Act said, but what it actually did even more, it was saying that um, urban areas had to now be reserved for white men um, who were in the leadership of the, South African, the Union of South Africa, British white men and African white men. And, I, and I'm using this language um, respectfully and selectively, because this is a conversation of healing. We need to know what we are healing ourselves from. When we talk about patriarchy, we are not talking about patriarchy because it is a wonderful word. Um, we are talking about patriarchy because we are saying it is just a theoretical school of thought that emanates from, from, from the antagonism of feminism. No, we are talking about patriarchy in the governance of South Africa as a reality. Um, when you talk about white supremacy, that is patriarchal. We are also talking about reality. The Union of South Africa was led largely by white men who happened to be British, who happened to be Afrikaner for many, many years. Only in 1930, white women in South Africa, only white women, not other women of color, were allowed to participate in politics and to vote also through these legislations. So we have a pattern, uh, uh, Makesha Madala and, and Phil Comrades, of segregation that is dependent on the grounds of race. The reason why our mothers in particular and our fathers 
could not vote in South Africa, could not participate in politics, were removed from land is precisely and only because we're black. It was because of racism. And this is important to know and remember so that when we talk about healing, we also know what are the actual things that need to be done to heal ourselves from those things. Um, and what it means then, practically speaking, just in the 1900s, it means that you have a dispensation where our mothers were moved from place, from pillar to post. Of course, there were lots of struggles, there were lots of, 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 of wars, there were lots of fightings, there were a lot of protests by our mothers. Uh, I have one minute left for this particular segment who were fighting and resisting this to say we are going to live on the pavements of the cities if it means we have to, because this is our land. This is our, this is our, um, our, 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 our place of, 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 of birth. You know? This is something that we have a right to occupy, we have a right to own. That is why you see some people are saying we are going to take back the land uh, in a sense that, that it emanates from that. When you, it, it, I always say in this one minute that I have, and, and, and other comrades. Imagine you are in your own house. For those of us who own houses, um, or who live in a particular piece of land, and someone walks in to your premises, maybe they need water, maybe they are thirsty. And the next morning they wake up and they tell you to leave. And they say they're going to send you a, a smaller piece of portion of whatever, and next to Gamakilan or across the road. That's exactly how land disposition happened. You know, you have someone that visits because they're exploring and they're looking for greater things in, in the land. And the next thing you know, how now we are being kicked out. We are now being told that this is where we're gonna live and this is not, we're not gonna live. So I will stop there for now, I will come back, but that is where we come from. And following the 1939 Act, there are a number of pieces of legislation, the native, um, um, the Urban Areas Act, the Group Areas Act that divided and deepened these, these divisions to a point where literally we were stripped of land, we were dispossessed of land. And this is the struggle that the democratic government of South Africa is on top of that we are all grappling with to say, how do we get back the land? Because land is our healing, land is our livelihood, land is our spirituality. Sing a band, Togozan. Um, a, a real education indeed and you really sparked on some very interesting facts there because um, the idea of African feminist or feminism or our mothers as feminists um, is exactly why we actually have this month that we are now celebrating because it was those same women that decided you cannot own our economic rights, you cannot own our, our freedom of movement um, and we are tired of you using your legislation um, to use, um, you know, this this concept of 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 of, of, of apartheid or, or racial segregation to limit our livelihoods, our way our ways of being. So I'm so happy that you were able to explore that and how these governments have and continue to use um, uh, racism really as a vehicle for land theft, which is continuing today. Um, so, oh, Comrade Manku, um, I'm not sure if she's back on Comrade Manku, I'm not seeing you. So, um, are you back? Thank you. Thank you so much. So, on to oh, Comrade Manku to, to give us her, her version um, and as, as she spoke of her version of history and how we come to find ourselves where we are today. Uh, thank you so much, Comrade Keke. I, uh, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Comrade Keke and the comrades on the line. Um, I would like us to look back to really uh, just taking, uh, following the lead of, of Comrade uh, Fix uh, when, she, when she spoke about patriarchy and all that. I think it is important to, to put it on record that uh, in Africa, we never had patriarchy until uh, colonizers arrived in this land. Women were given a very high position where the women could, could be consulted on issues that, 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 were, were, that were affecting the nation, that were affecting uh, the, the, the environment and everything. And, and women held political positions in Africa. Women were, 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 were seen to be part of the whole, um, 
uh, re revolution, uh, if we if we may say, and and on on, on the advent of of colonization, colonization, that is when we had this issue of patriarchy. But now women did not uh, sit back and say, okay, fine, now there's patriarchy in our country, in our continent, and we are just going to roll over and die. But they took it up to themselves. I mean, uh, we look at at women uh, from, from, from Kenya who stood by and who, who said, no, not, not in our country, we're not going to allow that. And, uh, and one of the things that we need to take note is that uh, activism and feminism existed in Africa before the word fe feminism was actually coined in 1837. So women were, were already st st stepping up to say, no, there are certain things that we cannot, we cannot allow in, in, our, in, in our continent. And, and hence it, it, they, they played that particular role. I mean, we, we're looking at women like uh, Bo, Bo Me, uh, Makatalili wa, wa, wa Menza. This is the woman who led the protest against the British colonialization administration that wanted to take African people and make them slaves. Because basically they were saying that all the African people that were captured there, they just need to come and and work for free. And you, we know very well that when we, you are working for free, you are actually a slave. And she fought the whole British colonization. And these are the women that are not being mentioned. And it, it is said that uh, when we talk about uh, women, we, we, you know, we just take it on the surface. Women have done incredible things in, 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 in our continent. I mean, Igbo, Igbo women, Igbo women have, have, have always challenged the system. They took it, they took it apart. I mean, if, even when they were not happy about something, th they knew the Igbo men and, and anybody that, 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 that was in the country knew very well that the Igbo women, they will wear their, they will wear their, their military way. And then they know that now it's war, you know, because that's, that's how it was. So it is important that when we look at these things, we need to understand. And they did not only do it just for the sake of doing it. it the issue was with land. We must really need to understand that each and every revolution starts and they end with land. Everything else comes in between. Everything else, it is a, a, pro, a byproduct of an issue of land. And that is where our women, you know, took it upon themselves. It happened even here in South Africa. Uh, people, they like to look narrowly on the issue of um, the past laws when, when women went to go march in 1959 to say, okay, fine, we, they are against the past laws. But if you look, if you diagnose it deeply, you will see that the issue had to do with land because we were dispossessed at that time. And uh, the women in, in Zirast, which uh, when they stage their match, their match is, is it's not really documented, but you, it's, it's, you get to understand uh, the grievances of the women that marched uh, in Zirast. The, 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 their issue was not only the issue of past, but it was also had to do with land because at that time, uh, that is when it was introduced that women cannot own land. And when we look at, it is, a, it, it is, an ev it is evident that when women are in charge of land, uh, they, they are able to do mighty things. They are able to, when they're in charge of agriculture, because when you take any, any woman who's a farmer and you put them on, on, on the land versus vis a man, that woman, it does not matter how small the land is, they will make sure that they produce and they use that land effectively. And this is something that we really have to, 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 to look at. Our mothers, they went all out. We're talking about Bo, 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 Mom, uh, Charlotte Matlake. We talk about Bo Lillian Goy. We talk about Bo Winnie Mandela. We talk about Bo Me Winnie Khwari. Those women, they, they, they stood up and they took they, 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 they started with the baton and they handed it to, over to us. Now, the question is, what are we going to do? And what I like uh, with the new uh, digital technology and all that is that our young girls, now they're, they're, not all, they're not saying our mothers, they used to, to walk the streets and fight for a particular cause. Now, because you know when we look at the pandemics, uh, we are limited that we cannot do certain things at a particular time because we are looking at the pandemic. 
Now they're taking it onto social me media, which I support so greatly because it means that the struggle continues. The struggle continues and we're not going to sit back and say, okay, fine, uh, this, is, this is not what we, that we, we can do. Now, um, you know, I, I, I'm inspired by a lot of women. Uh, women in Sierra Leone, you know, they played a crucial role where a, a black child, a black girl was not being allowed a, a right to education. In 1923, they started and they said, no, enough, enough is enough. Our girls, they also deserve the right to learn just like any other person. So the, these are the issues that we need to look at. Now, when we look at, the, there's, a, there's a landmark case in South Africa that, that, that challenges the issue of land and succession. And that is Bear versus uh, Bear and others versus uh, the magistrate of Kailicha, where the woman was challenging uh, the whole legal system to say, how can uh, customary law say that I cannot be a successor of my father's uh, um, you know, inheritance when she was the direct person that actually needed to, to inherit. And you know, that landmark case, you know, it's, it, it is part of the movement that we are in to say that this is what we are looking at. So uh, it, it, is, it is encouraging that we, we lo we're looking at this. Uh, I think I'll give uh, Comrade Jackie a, a chance to also uh, take a share on this issue. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Comrade Noruka, for, for raising these issues and in particularly the legal aspects um, of how the system has continued to suppress um, the role of women in, in politics or in shaping the world. Um, Comrade Jackie, on over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, fellow panelists, this has been very, very informative. Like I could, I could just listen and listen and listen for some time, I'm getting quite educated myself. Um, thank you so much. You know, Comrade Fix, uh, when you mentioned like places like, you know, that we know all of District 6 and Sophia Town, you know, as those sites for, for dispossession, I'd argue that in fact, the entire continent is District 6 and Sophia Town, you know? So where the violence maybe was more pronounced, I think that's where it was like, this system is, is so visibly violent, you know? And I think even thinking about what you were talking about, I mean, you gave us a lovely history as to how it happened and, and how it got to be and how these wars uh, that were fought by people from here were also a form of destruction. Because what it tells me is that for all of these centuries now, um, we have been serving foreign gods really, because if you cannot pray on your land, even if you cannot even speak our languages, if you cannot express, uh, express our cultures and traditions, we are a lot of people, you know, we may be a little bit more comfortable slaves uh, in terms of modern times, we could have assimilated well, uh, but we remain dispossessed, you know, and that's why many of the, 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 the bond trees will say things like, we are living in new apartheid apartheid, and it makes me wonder though, for how long, <laughs> you know, our ancestors have come and gone and tried to fight for this liberation, uh, we are still here doing it in uh, a free South Africa, uh, democratic South Africa at the very least, and we are still fighting the same battle, and in some cases it's getting worse. We are now um, uh, a country, when you look now at the, at the local uh, national aspect, uh, context, we are the most unequal society on earth. That's quite an achievement, you know, and we achieve this uh, when we're free. What this means is that the poor is getting poorer and the rich is getting richer and wealth and land are very closely related. And of course, racism is in there as well. And we know the majority of the race that is getting richer and the majority of the race that is getting poorer in Africa, you know? So for me, people would say, oh, you know, the people these days are so radical. I'm like, but we've been talking. We've tried all the polite ways and we are still here speaking the language for how long? You know, like we have Azap, who's not even represented in parliament. People talk about Biko all the time. I'm wearing a Biko shirt myself today in respect of Azap. I'm invited here as a guest. And thank you, KK, for trying to get into this political party that are patriarchal. You know, I read a little bit about Comrade Mangu in preparation for this. I can only imagine what she had to take to only be the only black woman after all of this time at the top in a country that is 50% women to have the ANC a party in power has been in existence for over a hundred years, led up to the top by women. But they even have not even been able to have a woman lead them. But women lead us in our communities. We're living in a country where two thirds of households 
are women-led. We haven't even gotten to the impact of all this racism and landlessness. What are women doing now? And I think I'll take it further and say, as much as we need each other, you know, and I want this about black men and black women or men and women, but we have to go to a spiritual element because we can't be crass anymore. The ways of the world are not going to work. We need divine intervention, guys. I'm 40 soon, you know. I've been at this since I was in my 20s. I'm exhausted. I don't want to have children who tomorrow are still going to be landless, you know. How much more must we negotiate? Must we still go vote and go into the market? What has it done for us? How much more are we going to uphold a system that is clearly a system of colonizers and very few colonizers? How much more of that language must we speak? How many talk shows, oh my God, must we continue to have? Land was stolen, you return that. And of course, it's not going to happen in a polite way. I'm not saying that we must become like the enemy we fight. They are crass. You know, that is crass and evil what was done. It is crass. Imagine Africans going to Europe and within a couple of centuries and decades, we are in charge of the land and they are our slaves. Years later, when they say that freedom is returned, we are still holding on to that land of theirs and they're speaking our languages and worshiping our God. And they don't have land and they're still politely asking us to talk about it. No, no, guys, no. Azapo, if you want to awaken, you start to play the spirit of Biko. Remember, for book with PAC, if you want to do something about it, and I can let you know, black men who are benefiting from the sweat and labor of black women, that time has come to an end because you guys will die and we will rise without you. We are invited here by Comrade KK as feminists. It was difficult for some of us to make the decision to be here. I'm glad I'm here because people are talking about it, but we kind of like we've been talking for a while and us at the bottom of the food chain, this thing is intergenerational. It's not just about today or yesterday or the 70s or 1912. It's not even just about 1652. It is the arrogance of the thieves to hold on to stolen goods and ask to still be mentally colonized. Big God died under the age of 30, killed for saying that we deserve a place at the table. We're still asking today? No, guys, no. So from a feminist perspective, from an African and black feminist perspective, dudes, wake up. We don't have time. We don't have time. Black men, wake up. You will never get the land. And if you're going to talk about masculinity and feminine and female and male, as, as our comrade Manku has just described, that's where the seed is put, without which there's nothing. We need the earth. While black women are oppressed and colonized and seen as second class citizens, as citizens because you're borrowing from your colonizers, because you want to be like the white man, as, as, as uh, Fanon has already told us, you want to be our new oppressors. You don't want to be equal, you just want to be the new boss. So that time is over. Black women deserve their place at the seat. Nobody's trying to say this one is better than the other one. Luckily, we are coming from a perspective of feminism that is about love and healing. We all know that we're all wounded and problematic. So when we encounter that in others, we try to, teach, uh, to treat that with love and compassion. And we trust it's going to be done for us as well. So I'm very angry when it comes to land. I'm unapologetic about that. But we are saying feminism is about healing. It's about restoration. And land is about spirituality. We have to restore that. And we must allow the divine feminine to rise within all of us. It's not about bodies. It's not as crass as they define you into boxes. We're spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings. That's how our healers can be either Gogo or, 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 or Kulu, depending on which spirit occupies them. And you guys are out there being transphobic and homophobic and sexist. How are you going to be complete and get your land back? You will forever remain slaves to your masters and foreign gods until you learn to respect where you come from, until you learn to respect the earth as a seed, until you find the divinity in being a woman. And that is nothing that is like a second class anything. In fact, it should be seen as something to aspire to because clearly patriarchy and masculinity has brought us here. And like Fikile, I can go on for a while, but I have to say the answer to our time lies in a beautiful ideology called feminism. Nobody's shooting anybody. Nobody's going to be as crass as those people. We need divine intervention, and it's going to be a revolution of love and healing, and it's going to be led by Black feminists. Thank you so much, Comrade Jackie, for that passionate um, engagement. Um, and again, you know, you're all touching on, 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 on African feminism and the importance of African feminism in being able to bring about the change um, that, that we need to see, not just for women, because we know that if change is going to happen, women will have to be at the forefront of that. Um, I would like to just ask um, to 
explore this concept of African feminism because there is an argument, like a very broad argument that says African feminism does not exist um, and feminism is a white construct. Um, I think Comrade Fix, you tried to break that down a little bit to say that really and truly, uh, and Comrade Manku, you've also mentioned um, the women of Sierra Leone. Um, so I'd like you to just break it down a little bit more in one or two minutes, um, the concept of African feminism and where we are and where we need to be going to be able to, to liberate our people because we all understand that it's going to take women to change the status quo. Um, the, 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 the issue of African feminism, like I said, uh, African feminism existed before 1837, before even the word feminism was actually coined. And it's quite sad, and I think it's, it's actually much more oppressive to think that African women cannot be femin fe feminist and African women cannot take up because if we, if we really have to look at what feminism is, it is, it is a cause of women that are fighting for a particular cause. So are we saying that African women are just sitting back and doing nothing? Uh, we just have to be led by the, by, 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 by the white masters and all that. No, African women, they stand on their own. Now, uh, there quite a number of, of, if we look, we can look in different countries. We can look at, let's go back as Sierra Leone, we can look at Kenya, and we can look at quite a number of, Afri of, of, of countries where women have stood up. And we can even go back as far as the particular queens that, are in, that were involved. I mean, Queen Tia, she made sure that you know, she did. She not. She did not just relax and sit on her laurels to say that she's a queen uh, and just you know be a trophy wife and all that. She ensured that when it comes to the legalistic ways of how her country performed, she was heading that department. And th this, these are some of the things that we look at. Uh, King, uh, queen Zinger made sure she fought hard to ensure that you know what African 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 men are not being abused by the British system, you know. So these are th these are the issues that we look at. But you know what is said, and which is which is quite quite disturbing uh, that uh, our, our men they also allow this issue of patriarchy to 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 cloud them so much. And even if when women are supporting the cause of men, when men have have a particular issue, but it's very difficult. Majority of men will not come and assist women when women are fighting a particular issue. Instead, they would rather say these women, these women, instead of joining and saying, you know what, women issues are human rights issues. You know, the, the, you cannot separate them because the reason why women are, part, are fighting for a particular issue is to ensure that there is equality, there is justice in all. So why should we wait to be uh, negatively affected before we can do something. I do not. I do not have to 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 wait until somebody that I am closely related to to be raped. Then before I can say something about rape, I need to talk now before it, it can even happen to anybody who is closer to me. So this is this is what we we have to look at. And when it comes to land, it 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 becomes a very sensitive issue because. Uh, our men were used as a weapon to also drive a wedge between ourselves because they allowed themselves when the system said they need to be ca uh, custodians of land they they took that that role you know and they 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 they, they ensured that you know what no woman actually owns the land instead of saying what women can own the land women can till the land and we know that when women tilled that particular land everybody gets to eat uh, I hope I've Thank answered. You. Yes, you have. Thank you so much. Um, Comrade Fix, I'd like you to take on the issue of this custodians of land, um, because this is true. When the uh, Ingonyama Trust um, inherited illegally um, the people's land from the apartheid government, they put on the boot on women in particular a lot harder. I'd like you to just um, take that on and, and have that quick discussion um, and give us a bit more education on that. Um, I, I just want to start by saying that the link to what we know today as Ingonyama Trust starts from 1951. And perhaps some of us can take it away beyond that. But I would like to make a point of reference with the Bantu Authorities Act of 1951. 
what the Bantu Authorities Act of 1951 did, it was an act that was brought um, by the government of the Union of South Africa, which was led by British men and African men. What that act did just after the segregation of uh, non-white populations into the reserves, it then made sure that the reserves were going to be governed by our chiefs um, and, and, and our kings. So what they, they did through the Bantu Authorities Act, they gave power to the chiefs um, to rule the reserves uh, in a separate um, system of governance, which is, which is what we all know now as the Bantu uh, system of governance. So it was through the Bantu Authorities um, Act of 1951. But what was problematic about, about that, that, that Bantu Authorities uh, Act is that the chiefs were actually not necessarily given power, but that was an act of tokenism uh, where the central government of the Union of South Africa still maintained power, um, still um, controlled the chiefs. And, and, and that thing then happened up to the liberation of South Africa in 1994, where we had in the negotiations during Cordesa, a situation where, for example, in Wazulu Natal, Amakosi and our chiefs were saying, we are not going to participate in this government of national unity unless you retain the power that was given to us by the government of the Union of South Africa as chiefs by giving us portions of land. And Guazul Natal in particular was then apportioned a number of sectors uh, of hectares of land um, to own under what you now know in Gonyama Trust. Uh, and the only sole trustee of Ngonyama Trust was the late uh, Ngozi Ukotun um, and, and of course now the new king Umdana Umisuzulu is probably going to take over. The conversations are still continuing. So that is how we, we end up with something that you couldn't really trust because then what, 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 what Ingos Ukutu Zolitini did, uh, they formed this trust and it became a sole trustee, which means that he becomes the chief uh, decision maker. And the trustee started to dispossess land from women, land that uh, was occupied by families our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, uh, and in some instances, of course, we had our fathers as well living in those in those pieces of land from the 1800s, from the 1700s. Now that this Bantu Authorities Act has was established, they were given um, ownership of that small those small pieces of reserves that were allocated to black populations or non-white populations, deepening uh, the fragmentation of our society, deepening the hatred and the fragmentation of our family structures. Um, and of course, deepening the gender divides in, in terms of now uh, entrenching patriarchal leadership and patriarchal hierarchies within the system of what you now know as Bantu stands. So that is what happened. Um, so what, what, what then happened is that women as custodians of land, because what was happening is that, oh, oh mama, for example, like oh, mama, these are the things that they were fighting for. Oh, mama, Ngubane died. She was the founder. A, um, of, 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 a, of a movement here in, in Basel Natal that was fighting for land, for, for women, for land's right to say, no woman should be removed from the land of their birth. Oh, Mama Ufigil and Changas was shot at, at, at her house for similar reasons, where a coal um, company wanted to, to remove women from land uh, you know, of their birth to build a coal company. We've got a number of these, of these stories where, where international corporations are coming to remove us from our pieces of land where our chiefs have been used. So Ingonyama Trust is that particular story. Of course, we all know that it ended up in court and the court has ruled in favor of, um, of the women who have been fighting and may, may, their, may their souls rest in power. So we talk about then the power of African feminism when we invoke Umama Usezane Ngubane, when we invoke Umama Lakubo Figilen Changase. And these are um, symbolisms of oh mama like Abu Asante Wa, who fought in the nation of Ghana, for example, for fighting for the for the liberation of the Ghanaian people from from colonization. Uh, you know, oh mama, oh Asante Wa, we all know the story cycle. For example, like you are saying, Comrade Manko was one of the women feminists in pre-colonial Africa who stood up and said. You men, if you are not going to fight the colonizers and stop them from taking our piece of land, 
we are going to do it. I'm going to call all the women in the land and we are going to fight until one of us has fallen from battle. And that is a symbolic statement that Umama Usiza Ningubane, Umama Ufigil and Jangasa took forward even in the battle around Ningubana Trust. Um, so we are hopeful, um, comrades, that with the ruling of the, of the courts uh, in favor of, of the women who were taking Ngubana Trust to court, that we are going to see changes. We have to see changes. Uh, feminism has got to prevail and we, we cannot let that story be eradicated because it was the front line, the bodies of our grandmothers who carried that revolution, black mothers in particular. And I think it's very, very important to center it in that way. So when we talk about then women as custodians of land, I would also like to invoke generations of, 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 of activism that has been done by the rural women's assembly, you know, um, amongst others as well, uh, who have been saying at least give one hectare to one woman uh, in South Africa for land as a way of, 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 of giving back land. And that is not enough. But I'm, I'm making an example um, of the rural, rural Women's Assembly. I've noted the one minute uh, comment, Keke, because that is where we are saying women, uh, as women's bodies, we are actually bearers of the seed. We are bearers of land. Um, and this is a story uh, of migration. When, when our fathers, when our great grandfathers went to war, they went to fight and went to, into politics. And I'm saying we are selectively because we never walk alone. In my body, I carry my grandmothers and my great grandmothers. We were the people that had to stay at home and till the land. We were the people that had to make sure there was food in the land. We were the people, Ebesi Pasha M. Samo, see in the pieces of land. Our mothers who live in our bodies today did that work. And that is the feminism we talk about. There's always been feminism in Africa. There's always been feminism in our homes. And feminism, it is a way of life that recognizes the fact that umundu, umundu, ngabandu, we are, it is, I always argue, a system of Ubuntu that recognizes the union of the feminine and the masculine in our bodies, in our lives, the egalitarianism that we are, and I can never be without you. You can never be without me. Only patriarchy came and fragmented that system. So you have of Ubuntu. Togozan. Comrade Jackie, uh, Comrade Manku speaks of a betrayal, speaks of a betrayal of uh, black men betraying black women. Um, and allowing themselves to be used by the system, one, to position women right at the bottom of the human hierarchy. We all know when it comes to landlessness, poverty, um, right at the bottom of that is Black women. And our Black men have been part of these racist systems that oppress women. What is your take on this conversation? I mean, I mean that's what um, I, I just mentioned now, for example, with the ANC, you can have of many women who come there, the women who names much like and my my Gizella, who was running things. Uh, uh, well, come well, come well, Jackie, just one second. Yeah. Your your voice. I don't know whether it's the unit, but you are very crackly. Okay, let me just move my head to the back. It might be that. Is that better? A little bit. And how about now? Maybe if I have to move. Yes, that's much better, better. That's much better. Thank you. Uh, are, are you sure? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I was talking about how it is. That's a fact because, like, when you look at political parties, for example, the fact that you find that women like Bob Mema Kaikele, Bob Mema Dikizela, were actually running things, but you get that it's, it's um, other people who are chosen to be leaders and presidents um, instead of those women. I mean, when you look at the ANC politics, um, Luma was chosen over over Mema Dikizela Mandela. It doesn't make any sense to anyone. Uh, but that's what happened. That. Even a person that was a life partner, uh, because she was demonized uh, for, for being the person that she was, uh, went with Uzuma. They, so black men have got this thing where they do what actually the white nation does. They close the rank and uh, the people outside the rank are usually the black women. And you find that white people and black men actually don't mind selling black women out. You know, if it suits them, whether it's for like capitalist agendas or political agendas, where for example, um, somebody like Mema Digizela still talking about nationalization, and in the case of Kristen who was murdered, um, somebody like that day, that day Nelson Mandela, um, no longer talking about that and talking about other things that take, that betray the struggle. Before she passed away, 
may we name my digital Mandela who ended up being demonized. She held this country together for almost three decades. And then she was demonized at the end of it, you know? Um, she said that the same guy who went into prison is not the same guy who came out. And we don't like to talk about it, especially the departed in such a manner, but what happened in Cordessa though? Where are the minutes, you know? Who sold what out and what does it mean? Um, that today we've got a few select people who are the beneficiary of so, so many programs that have come and gone, no cares, your, even the so-called BEE, we know it's for the elite. In the main, the black majority for people who don't have certain connections or have not had access and, and opportunities or privileges to access certain education or to come from certain classes, people are struggling out here. You know, how, how is it okay that a, a struggle that was held together by the majority, those majority are left on the sidelines now. Like it's every man for himself, but we know that we carry each other. And in the main, we find that this horrible thing of, of women being put to the side and living in households and in communities, but not in political leadership has become normalized. Why can't women be leaders here? And I'm gonna take a go to also the question I'm seeing in the comment section on, on Facebook. Um, somebody say there isn't something like um, African feminism. What our mothers did was simply to be leaders. I think, beloved, just because there is no African language equivalent of something, and then there's an English language of it, it does not make that thing an African. Uh, Comrade Fikila just spoke about how feminism is a way of life. Oh, my grandmothers, they were of course feminism. How did they make, you know, they, they made that miracle of Jesus of multiplying bread and loaves look like a joke. When you look at how much they did with so little, and in some ways we have to also look at the positive side, and that's what some of us, the younger people, that's how some of the feminists, the black feminists, we are gonna do it on our own if we have to, because we kind of like have, except we've been holding and lifting other people on our shoulders who then discard us when it's opportunistic for them to do so, when it's convenient for them. So I completely agree with that statement that black women have been taken to the side and discarded and made pariahs and made demons. And sometimes black men and white people will coincide to put black women as a demon while we are the ones who raise our own children as well as the madam, as well as take care of the black man. But the, the reward for that is not seen. The labor that we do is not considered to be labor. So black women do majority of, of the labor Imagine a world one day where, where, where there are no black women in it. <laughs> just one day, just one day. But you can imagine, imagine one without other people. Why is that the case? And yet we are at the bottom of the school chain. We must look at this thing. It, it is the strangest thing to, to have black women be at the bottom of the ladder while we do most of the work, whether it's intellectual, emotional, or care work in the home. And yet the reward for us is hardly ever seen. In fact, if somebody can dispose of us, uh, or rather dispose of us at their convenience, they will do so without betting an eyelid. So black women, I think we need to choose ourselves first as well. Thank you so much, Comrade Jackie. Um, and, and also, I think you have answered uh, a comment from Olehile Siyabo. Comrade Olehile, if you um, are not happy with the answer, please um, raise your hand. We, we will see you and you can join this conversation. I'd like to open up the floor now um, to our guests who are you know, joining us um, to come in, ask questions or to add um, to the conversation that we are having. And so whilst we are waiting for people to engage with this, I just want to acknowledge um, the chat room um, and in the chat room um, I see um, I see a message from Bapiwe saying powerful incredible panelists and comrade Yvette Abrahams this is really powerful thank you so much comrade uh, Abrahams um, we also have uh, from uh, somebody let me see um, Mom Metzing says, Comrade Jackie, the passion is palpable. Um, and Homozo is saying, I owe it to my kids and grandkids to share this session and the lessons learned here. I'm grateful to the panelists. Um, and then we have somebody saying, with the contribution of comrades, I see the reemergence of black consciousness and pan-Africanist philosophies. Comrades, you have nailed it. Um, um, and then comrade Francine Nkosi says, thank you, I am empowered. Makosi Baninzi says, it's time now that women lead us to true liberation. Thank you for your contribution. Um, and uh, comrade 
I think happy. I was told Nomsizi cry tato bereng mo metalepule kware mapiri masigela are dead. No, they are alive. They speak through the voices of comrades like Okomet Vigi, Lokikele, Zokomet Manku, Komet Jackie, and many others. Forward with the women of Azania. And Garabo Finia says, lead women, lead, and we need women like you. Uh, Matsidiso Morocco says, it is time that African women should take their rightful place and liberate Azania. Our country is in a state of disaster and the voice of black women is not heard. I could not agree with you more. Um, Garabo Finias comes back to say, female activism in the past two decades, scholars have begun to pay more attention to female political activism in South African history. And Hape has come back to say African men are scarce uh, or are scared to be led by their women. It begins at home. It is male chauvinism. Oh, I would actually greatly add we speak of chauvinism, but also misogyny. There is a definite hatred of black women, a systemic hatred uh, of black women. Uh, Moms Metzing says, I think the panel said a very important aspect that black men sometimes or always act like the colonizers and, op and, and oppressors of women. There is this belief that women are also their own enemies, sometimes acting as similar to men crushing their own when they get a higher call into their table, they close the door behind another woman. What is the panel's thoughts with regards to this? So I'm gonna stop, stop here and ask the panelists to quickly respond to this question that I am very passionate about. This idea of, um, they, they, they've given it names, some call it, uh, pull her down syndrome, a PhD, women have PhD, and others are calling it um, a, 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 a you know, dropping the ladder. You get up the ladder and then you drop it. What is your take on this? Uh, I'll start with you, Comrade Fix, in one minute. Oh, my oh, goodness, my in goodness. one minute. Ooh. Or two. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm breathing because, because um, it's quite a reality, right? That um, we, we, are, we, are, we are building um, feminist leadership and feminist governments um, in South Africa, governance in South Africa, um, from wherever we are sitting, everywhere. Yet there is that challenge of of, of pull head down. Um, I would say, Kekeleto, we have always loved each other. Um, this is a revolution of love and healing. Um, we really have always loved each other, and and I think that if you look at the manner in which our mothers and our grandmothers have done it over the years that uh, that shows that regardless of the differences it doesn't mean that we you know there, were, there, there are no challenges of differences that we do not that we agree all the time and we say we love each other no we agree to disagree we tell each other what it is but we have always loved each other so it is not really uh, necessary to pull each other down because when you're talking about feminist governance and feminist leadership and feminist healing we are talking about various pockets of all of us uh, whoever we are in our diversities in our differences whether we are in political parties whether in civil society whether we are in our farm in our farms whether at home within the street committees everywhere we are you know feminism is not a homogeneous way of life uh, we need to we need to acknowledge our differences um, and this is what Otto Lot says, that uh, our challenge is really not, it's not really our differences, but it is our inability to recognize the strength that we have in our differences. And I think as soon as we realize that, um, that is actually our power, uh, so in one minute, I will end it at that, to say, let us embrace each other. Let us love each other, um, as different as we are, as diverse as we are, even in our blackness, because black women are not a homogenous AA group. But we need to, we need to see each other. We need to remember who we are. Singabantu, Togozan. Comrade Manku, your voice, please. Uh, you know, it is, it is really sad, uh, Kikiletso, and I was hoping that this question never comes up, but obviously it would come up. <laughs> uh, uh, it is said that indeed, the, when we have to face reality, there is that pull head down syndrome. And I don't think I can actually sum it up much better than Comrade uh, Fix to say, you know what, at the end of the day, we need to acknowledge that we are different. And with our differences come 
women's strength. Because what I have, you might not even have, but when we match up together, we become one powerful combination. So we, as women, this is something that we really need to look at. This is something that we really need to, to visit and ensure that whatever that we do, we really have to love each other and say, you know what, we might be different, but for this particular cause, uh, we agree on something and let us fight with all our, our, our being to ensure that we conquer. The rest we can see later. Thank you so much. Comrade Jackie, um, in light of the same subject, I'm just looking at this and I'm thinking, is this not maybe a subject or a result of um, the scarcity mentality or the brokenness that we need to fix within ourselves before we call it a PhD sim uh, syndrome? Um, your take, please. Um, I think that's that. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Awesome, okay. Um, it's, it's like Kumit Mangalfu, like, don't like this question. It's a very weird question because nobody ever talks about the Pulsium Down syndrome. Look at Ramaphosa and Cyril, they don't exactly, I mean, Cyril and Zuma, they don't exactly love each other. They're not exactly pulling each other up. Tabo and Zuma were not exactly pulling each other up. So, like, Malema and Zuma, like, you know, they're always fighting. The thing is, we punish women for being human, you know? And when something happens in, you, in, in women, and then the same thing happens in men, you kind of, like, elevate women to this angelic being thing. In theory, but in practice, they're downtrodden, right? So we are human beings. And sometimes we'll get people who are your tribe. Sometimes we'll get people who are mean-natured, people who will do anything for ambition, whether they are women or men. So I think there's a pull-him-down syndrome and there's a pull-her-down syndrome. It's a human condition. It's not a woman condition. Thank you so much, uh, Conrad Jackie. Um, I see um, Yvette Abraham's hand is up. Um, Comrade Yvette? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, such good a afternoon. pleasure to be here in, in, this, um, in, 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 in this lovely gathering. Um, you, you know, a little known fact about me is that I was a member of Azastum um, up until 1986. Um, this was when most, most people were in exile or, or in jail. It was a difficult time. Um, and left because I was one of only two out lesbians in the DC movement and the constant harassment, oh my word, it, it was too much. But but remembered what Eco said that, that, that black consciousness is bigger than any one organization is the reason why he called it the black consciousness movement. And and the side of myself, I hope ever since on, on carrying the message of black consciousness and, and pan-Africanism forward. Um, and, and, and I think there's a lot to be said for, for returning to, to our ideology in, in understanding what feminism means in the African context, in, in the black context. I mean, Vika also said when somebody tells you that you are worthless often enough, sometimes you start to believe them. And I think the same thing applies to women. When, when people, have, people have told us that we are worthless, for so really, for such a really long time, and some small parts of us start to believe them. So, so I want to return us back to basics. I want to say, is the battle of black feminism not really worth seeing? I mean, when, when somebody sees it necessary to pull another woman down to get her head, then there's a profound lack of self-confidence in her. I mean, if I believe I have to do you down, to get somewhere, then what, what am I saying about me? You know, why, why would I not be good enough just to get somewhere through my own efforts? And I think it reflects in, in so many different ways when, when, when we, we listen to the message of the struggle is within and when, when we conquer that enemy, that internalized patriarchy, that internalized racism, then I don't think anybody is going to be able to I, I have the full confidence. I mean, we've already run practically every revolution there was. I mean, as I saw my I cooked the food, I organized the conference, I took the notes, I hitchhiked up to Joburg. Already then we were running the movement. I'm sure it has not changed. So at what point do we say, I'm going to give my power to myself and my sisters and not to other people who keep on bringing me down? Yeah, uh, 
Mativé, thank you so much. Um, I didn't know that about you. So this is this is really truly being an education. Um, Comrade uh, Yvette is one of the people that we are trying to actually bring on uh, at a later time um, during the course of this month um, to discuss certain issues um, that pertain to women. Um, and I'm hoping that she will accede to our request and come and grace this pan and this this platform as a, as a, as a panelist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Comrade uh, Vives. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go back to the panel. Anybody else who wants to engage, um, please uh, lift your hand and we'll be able to see and we'll give you a platform. So whilst we wait for others, I think I'll just go back um, into the chat room. Um, this, I think this is Samu says, uh, this is divine intervention. What's the first thing that Jehovah God gave to the first men and women? It was land. Uh, what was the first thing that Jehovah God promised and gave to his nation after he released them from Egypt, um, Egyptian slavery? Uh, he gave them land. Terra is using indigenous and spiritual knowledge to mitigate GBV and empower women to own land. We're rolling out this in five provinces. Uh, we need land, we need to liberate and empower women. Um, and Gertrude says, thanks, thanks for the great input. I really want to add the fact that the indigenous people were powerful, dignified and independent. With the gold and diamond rushes uh, occurred in South Africa, it was the black people who provided fresh food for the international settlers from all over the world. But because the colonialists required cheap labor, they introduced the hut tax in the late 1800s. This forced black men to take up labor in the mines in order to have the cash to pay the hut tax. I also hope some of you will check out the African Feminist Charter in the internet, about 30 women from different African um, countries came together to formulate it collectively with input from their countries. Um, so maybe if we can get a link to that and we can share it, that would be great. Matsiri Somoroka says, I cannot agree with you more with, Go I cannot agree more with Gogo Figile. Black women are not homogenous. We should not forget that there are class differences as well. And Samu says, we need to have a call to action after this discussion. Men need a mindset change. I will echo that compliment. There was a time when we spoke of Amandla Amnyama, and that meant black men and their power and their might and their influence. And today, when you talk of black men, you talk about Amandla Amnyama, you're talking about the violence that black men exert on black women and this disempowering relationship we have with black men so with this you know platform we're hoping that we can engage with black men and black women can have an opportunity to actually tell our partners our brothers um our kids that, that we are in this together and for the true liberation of our people to happen um there needs to be this relationship and and, and this trust um somebody says i hope the analysis of the disposition of the land of the indigenous peoples of the First Nations, like the Khoisan, the original inhabitants of this country are included. We even find that Isikosa has, because of interaction with the Khoi people, three of the cliques of the four that are in the Kwe, Hwe, Kwe, Goab language. I hope that I said that correctly in my colonized language. Uh, yeah, we need some, some re-education there. Thanks for the great input. I really want to add the fact that the indigenous people were powerful, dignified, and independent. Okay, I think we've read through this one. Um, Nelisa Jojo says, what a great session. Thank you to all the panelists. My mind has been liberated. Karabo says, absolutely inspiring. Um, I'm not sure if there's any more comments coming from the floor, um, but I'd like to give our panelists uh, an opportunity to give us their closing remarks um, and some food to take home and to mull over for the next week. Um, and just before everybody gets off, I need to say that this, um, this month in particular will have a strong focus on women and women's issues. I urge you to please join in. Um, and also, if at all possible, send me a private message with your number and we can send you details of our next conversations. Over to you, uh, uh, Comrade Manku, first. Thank you so much, uh, Sis Kekelet. Uh, 
Well, on my closing remarks, I, I just feel that I need to touch on what I picked up from the land audit report uh, that was done in 2017. And uh, it, will, it, will, it will show us the reality of the land disposition as we looking at it right now in, 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 in these times that we call democracy. Uh, I, I specifically look at the land that is owned by private individuals. And I just want you to see disparities here. 72% of agricultural land is owned by whites. 15% is owned by what we they term uh, colored individuals, 5% uh, by what they term in Indian individuals, 4% by African individuals, 1% uh, is owned by co-owners, 3% by others, which means it's foreign investors. Now, uh, when, you, when you take it down, when you do a, set, a further research and you want to, to understand how are women, more specifically, if we go to, if we specify on African women, uh, there isn't an audit that specifically tells you that uh, African women, this is the percentage that they own. And I feel that it was done deliberately by a government so that these things should not come up, you know? And uh, also there's this 1% that is being owned by co-owners. That particular 1%, when they, when they mean the co-owners, they mean the co the co-ops. Now, we are, we are always saying women should form co-ops and all that. They're only owning 1% of the land. How disgusting is that? That's mm -hmm. my uh, closing remarks. Think about it. Uh, we need a serious revolution in this country. Thank you so much, Comrade uh, Manku. Uh, Comrade Jackie, your closing remarks. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Gregor, for the invitation to come here. I've also really learned a lot, and thank you to the fellow panelists as well. And some of the messages from the people who are here, much appreciated. Um, I, I will have to agree, and I've been agreeing, you know, with the sentiment of needing a revolution, because democracy is actually fertile ground for revolution. But also, I think we have to be a little bit smarter than what currently exists as a solution to what, what's out there. You know, um, we speak about a revolution of love and healing. And then people think that what we can, what do you mean? Like, where are we going to get the guns from? Uh, I think I started by talking about um, spirituality and needing divine intervention and not being as crass as the colonizers. You know, you cannot dismantle the master's house with, with the master's tools, as it said. You know, so we have to find out our own ways of doing things. We have to trust in ourselves. And that means we have to trust ourselves, literally trusting with ourselves. And somebody particular spoke about, for example, one person, one hectare, or one family, one hectare, starting with the very land from under our feet. I also see um, Yvette has, has commented, and then she's writing that sometimes, you know, because we are socialized and brought up um, in, in this um, white supremacist patriarchal capitalist society, it, it gives no wonder that we take some of those things with us because it's all we know. And sometimes that feminism is scary because people don't know what that is. So what I urge feminists to do, and feminists in my spaces are already doing this, I'm doing my little bit of laying the brick as well, is to build our own alternatives because the system is failing, whether they like it or not. So we have to be able to get together and work together and do differently from the past, do differently from the patriarch, do differently from the enemy, and seek divine intervention in order to be those people that we, we have been waiting for. Get food in the comment section, uh, speaks about the queer people and the same people, uh, and, and she's right. There, there's no conversation around land and especially spirituality if we do not mention the queer people and the same people. We look at Cape Town as this uh, little Europe, it's as African as the rest of us. It's as, as African as Soweto. But we have a belief that certain things that are true, this and true, that belong somewhere else. That's mental change. That Biko already, when he died all those years ago, people like Sabuko were talking about. How come we are still there? You know, how come we're speaking in English, for example? What are we losing uh, by doing this? What are we gaining, if anything? And now that we can hear each other across this language, how are we using all of these things to liberate ourselves? Because we believe that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So there's something in the closet as well. How do we take that at our own thing? You can't call it and look to the past, but also know that it's not ideal take what works and move forward with it. Trust ourselves again. How do we take back what has, uh, how do we claim back what has taken away from us? So I think um, I'll go back to the beginning and saying that from, from where the black feminists are sitting, where African feminists are sitting, the only answer to our times from the system is, is, is African feminism, is black feminism. And um, we no longer asking, you know, we're gonna do it on our own. We are doing it on our own. Our mothers did it on, the, on their own. People are still doing it on their own. We would love to do it together. We really would. Uh, but without being uh, pariahs, without being the ones who are going to be compromised, without being left to the side, because that time is over. 
If you don't see a person as an equal, maybe you shouldn't be in that space and then disturb them while they're doing what they're trying to do as well. Otherwise, you want to work together, but only as equals. Thank you so much, Comrade Jackie. Um, Comrade uh, Fix, I, if you could just please uh, give us your closing remarks and also um, a little bit on why it is so critical to have a feminist-led government um, to, to, to be able to, to bring about the change we so desire. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade KK, um, and to all the panelists and to, to all ev everybody that is uh, commenting, absolutely wonderful um, comments. I would like to, to say exactly wh where you started, KK. We need a feminist-led and healing-led um, governance uh, system in South Africa. Uh, whether that system is within the political party system that we have currently, or whether that system is outside of it, we need change. And, and that change is recognizing that our mothers, uh, our great grandmothers have led our homes during the liberation struggle, have led our homes during colonization, during these systems of oppression, and we have survived, even though we carry those cracks. Let us go back to that power. Let us remember who we are. All political parties, all civil society organizations, all of us where we are, let us rise in feminist um, leadership, let us rise in feminist healing. And, 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 and when we call in this, in this way, we are saying that feminism is for everybody. Um, we are talking about the feminine divinities that uh, live inside of us. This revolution that we are waging is a revolution of love and healing. And it's very much centered within our spiritualities uh, as a people, which is something that was taken away and dispossessed from us. But we remember who we are. We know who we are, like you are saying, Ukomit Steve Biko did that in 1975. And Umama Wini, uh, I heard today in the news that Brantford is being named uh, Winnie Mandela. She rose actually with Umama Ufrini Junala those, those days to, to form what was called then the Black, um, the Black Women's Federation out of frustration of hatred that was of course um, forced by racism, but we cannot do that. Right? We cannot do that through love and through revolution, through healing. And the, the first thing to do is land. Uh, there's no other way we have to get back to land. Land makes us happy. Land, um, we can dance in land. We can, we can pray in land. We can heal ourselves through land. Land is our livelihoods. Land is our economy. Um, you know, so we can heal the economy of the world. We have enough resources to feed everybody on earth, on the planet. So that is our healing. Um, and that is why it is important that uh, we recognize, somebody was saying, I can't remember it was you, Kumikeke, that how is it possible that in the last more than 100 years, we do not have a woman um, leader in our political system. What does that tell us about the woundedness of our political system? This morning, I read a book by somebody just been published and I want to reference it and, and, and say to us, can we please read it? That says, you have struck a rock. I think it's written by Ukuku Buthungo. Uh, talking about these issues of where have we been as mothers and our mothers uh, in, this, in this struggle, really, in this grappling, I like the topic, in this grappling with landlessness and the, and the woundedness of the country. So we need to reclaim um, all of those things um, and trust women's bodies. We have women's bodies, by the way, in, in government. It's not that we do not have, we don't have a shortage of that. We've got beautiful policies. Our mothers have been there. I think we are close to 45% of parliamentarians uh, who are women, but something has not changed fundamentally in terms of, 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 of the violences that we see. So we need something different. Um, and, and, and that is what we are saying. Uh, feminist rising is important. That is not just about bodies, but it is about systemic change. We need to do things differently. And that is doing things from a place of love. We need to do away with all systems of oppression, capitalism. And it calls us, you know, and it sounds like we're talking big words, but actually it's about returning to Ubuntu, returning to who we are and just remembering ourselves. And it does call on us also to give up uh, the joys of oppression, because what has happened over time is that, um, as I wrap up, Gege, is when the Bantu authorities at 251, for example, gave power to the chiefs, it was done forcefully, by the way. Um, our fathers were forced to rape. It's important to, to say this. Our fathers were forced to lead in the manner that, like you were saying, at some point we were talking about black power or Amanda, Obumnyama, Bamadota, Esintu, Kwaku, Yinto, Ente. 
but we can no longer talk about that because that was done forcefully. Even during slavery, our fathers were forced to watch uh, the oppressors raping our mothers and, and, you know, in front of them. So this is something that was taught, something that is internalized, right? It's an internalized depression that continues to perpetuate itself uh, in some form today. And I, I like what Tukoko Yvette has said in closing, to heal ourselves from where we are, we actually really have to realize that we are living with post-traumatic stress disorder as a nation. Um, and, and some of that we have liberated ourselves from um, systemically, but we are not out of it. This is what Franz Fanon talks about. He talks about the pitfalls of our national consciousness uh, to say that the pitfalls of our liberation remain the fact that we have come back in our bodies, in our language, we call this liberation, but our psyche is left behind in, in oppression. Um, our spirits are left behind in oppression. So Gufanele, in, in, I don't know how to say this in English, Gufanele is Landa. We need to, to cleanse ourselves. We need to bring ourselves back. And some of these things is, is about returning to the power of ritual um, as we know it. And ritual, I'm not talking about Bungoma because I know I speak as a song, but I'm talking about the power of ritual in any other way that the Khoi people uh, have done ritual, that the Sun people have done ritual. I was, least, I, was, I was remembering Namibia not so long ago. Thank you, Gertrude, for raising this. Yesterday, you know, how the Germans dispossessed the Khoi, the Khoi and the Sun people in, in Namibia you know, of land um, at that time, and here in South Africa as well, how, how it happened. So we need to ritualize ourselves back and, and it's possible, and the feminist-led and healing-led government is about that. It's about saying, let us go back, see Zilanda, see and return that which we are, things that we were taught, that we've internalized, which is even hating each other, um, are things that we have to first acknowledge to say, I carry this as well, I've internalized it, and we all become honest to each other and allow the process of healing to unfold. It's gonna take years, but it has to begin, uh, and that is where we should be, Tobuzan. I thank you so much for those wise words. And I, um, I'm really glad that you were able to touch on um, the healing aspect. And just to say that somewhere in the month, later on in the month, we will be talking about the woundedness of our people and that it is absolutely critical for Azania to heal itself um, and to understand all of these past traumas and how those past traumas are allowing us or making us bleed well into the future. Um, very quickly, next week's conversation is going to be with Mpo um, um, and this one talks to the role of women in changing the status quo. What is it that women can and should be doing to change the status quo? I'm hoping that you will be a part of this conversation. Um, and also on the 22nd, uh, on the 22nd, the conversation is African culture and the fight against gender-based violence um, and whether or not our culture enables or it aids or you know it actually makes gender-based violence possible or you know these things that Dr. Figula is talking about um, the internalized hatred um, and traumas learned traumas um, from our past will be part of the conversation that we'll be having on the 22nd I do hope that you will be part of it um, before I close um, it would be a mess of me not to read the last comments um, from our guests. So if you will just bear with me, we are a little bit out of our time, but if you could just give me two seconds, um, uh, Gertrude will definitely keep you in, uh, will keep in contact with you and send you more information about our chats um, going into the future. Um, and Bernice says, thank you to the host and the panelists. I'm educated. I'm very proud of you guys. And we have, um, uh, Matsi Diso says, I love the energy in this session, very powerful. Let's not just celebrate women in August. This should be done every day. What is ought to be done going forward? For the African Feminist Charter, just type the African Feminist Charter and it will come up on Google. We'll definitely do that. The topic of feminism is a contentious one, both in South African society and contemporarily, as well as historically, says Karabo Phineas. Um, Mom's Med Singh says this was an interesting session. I thoroughly enjoyed the engagement. However, I think we need to be careful not to flip flop and name the same things differently, depending on who does it. When the same thing is done by men, it's oppression. And when it's done by the same women, 
who are take who are talking against the said behavior done by men we then say women are heterogeneous all women are human as women we need to reflect um, and acknowledge that there is also a struggle of women against women as uncomfortable as it is as uncomfortable as it is as contentious as it is but it's a very important topic i really want to acknowledge the the wealth of information the panelists have uh, have shared with us and the passion of engagement it has been an interesting session worthy of all the time and informative strength strength and rise raleboha uh, to the inspirational panelist, says Tanusha uh, Raniga. And Happy says, let us rise with Azapo. Uh, Karabo says, we should have a student movement. Dr. Figile Vilagas, let us rise and heal ourselves. It is time. It is time uh, for a feminist and healing led government is the way to go. It is time. I couldn't agree with you um, more. It is time for a feminist-led government. And um, I'm sure that Azapo is listening. They are hearing this and they understand that an inclusive leadership is critical um, to the emancipation of our people. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us, Comrade Noruka. Comrade Vilagazi, uh, Comrade Jags, thank you so much for making the time. And um, I thank the Azapo uh, online political education platform for having given us the space to come here and have these discussions. To all our guests who have taken the time and the ones that are watching us on Facebook, thank you so much for making the time to be with us. I am eternally grateful for your time. Thank you for the education and the engagement. Manga. Thank you, panelists. Manja. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm so it's educated. Wow. Well, we, we so really, much for the space. Uh, we really, we, oh. I really appreciate. You know, it's from the bottom of my heart. I've learned so much. You know, <laughs> you can't say you you know so much. And I've learned. And uh, Dr. Figile, thank you so much. Uh, I hope Keke Lotto, you give us the contact number so that we can be in chat. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. It's enough now, we're taking the power back We're stronger than before, we're proud, proud or too strong The worst is over, from Cape to Cairo I'm Morocco to Madagascar From Cape to Cairo to man.